Chapter 15, The Dynam Dynamic Ocean. Ocean Water Movements. Surface circulation, ocean currents, are masses of water that flow from one place to another. Surface currents develop from friction between the ocean and the wind that blows across the surface. These form huge, slowly moving gyres. They own a surface circulation with five main gyres. The North Pacific Gyre, South Pacific Gyre, North Atlantic Gyre, South Atlantic Gyre, Indian Ocean Gyre. These are related to atmospheric circulation. So here in this diagram, we have the North Atlantic Gyre, where water is circulating this way. The South Atlantic Gyre, circulation this way. The Indian Gyre, or this way. Okay, the North Pacific Gyre, oops, this way. And the South Pacific Gyre. Okay. Now the direction of the ocean currents deflected by the Coriolis effect. So the water is deflected to the right in the Northern Hemisphere and to the left in the Southern Hemisphere. Four main currents generally exist within each gyre. Now what's important to su surface currents is one, they affect climate. Currents from low latitudes to higher latitudes bring warm currents and transfer heat from warmer to cooler areas. The influence of cold currents is most pronounced in the tropics or during the summer months in mid-latitudes. This causes upwelling, the rising of cold water from deep layers, most characteristic along west coast of continents, brings greater concentrations of dissolved nutrients to the ocean surface. Deep ocean circulation, a response to density differences, factors creating a dense mass of water, or temperature, colder water is denser, salinity, density increases with increased salinity. This is called a thermohaline circulation. Thermo is a temperature and haline has a salinity. Most water involved in the deep ocean currents begin in the high latitudes at the surface. A simplified model of ocean currents is similar to a conveyor belt that travels from the Atlantic Ocean through the Indian and Pacific Oceans and back again. So here's our idealized conveyor belt model of ocean circulation. Okay, so, so warm wires sink, come cold, and travel the Atlantic and the South the Pacific, rise up and warm up again, and travel back up the surface. Okay, So it sinks and travels below the surface. Here it actually splits. When it rises up to the surface as warm water, it continues a surface warm, warm flow. The coastal zone, the land-sea boundary. The shoreline is a contact between land and sea. The shore is the area between the lowest tidal level and the highest areas affected by storm waves. The coastline is the seaward edge of the coast. The beach is the accumulation of sediment along the landward margin of the ocean. Okay, so here is the coastal zone. Okay, so the coast, here's our coastline. Okay, so here's the coast. This, this is here, from here to here is the, well, from here to here is the shore. Here's the back shore from the high tide line up to the coastline. Here we have a rise of sand called the berm. The foreshore shore is from the high tide line to the low tide line. The shoreline is, is halfway between high tide and low tide. And here we'll have a dipping uh, beach face with a slope. Our near shore is the just under the water, just below the low tide zone. And then offshore, we get further out. Ocean water movements, waves. waves. Waves are the traveling energy along the interface between ocean and atmosphere. They derive their energy and motion from wind. Parts of the wave. We have a crest, the peaks of waves. Troughs are the uh, low points of waves. Okay. And how we measure a wave. Well, the wave height is the distance between a trough and a crest, or the amplitude of a wave. The wavelength. It's a horizontal distance between successive crests or troughs, which is the frequency. And wave period is the time interval for one full wave to pass a fixed position. Okay. So at the top of our waves, we have our crests. Okay. At the bottom of our waves, we have troughs. Okay. The distance and height between the trough and the crest 
is the amplitude or wave height. The distance from crest to crest, or from trough to trough, is our wavelength or our frequency. Okay. Now also, as, as we see in this slide, also, uh, energy is actually moving, well, the energy is traveling this way, the wave movement's going this way. The particles in the water kind of just kind of bob and sink with the wave and kind of stay in place. It's a little circle bob, circular bobbing and sinking. Okay. So wave height, length, and period depend on wind speed and the length of time the wind is blowing and the fetch. The fetch is the distance that the wind travels. As the wave travels, the water passes energy along by moving in a circle. The waveform shape moves forward. At depth of about one half the wavelength, the movement of water particles become negligible, ne 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 negligible on the um, wave phase. Okay, so as a wave moves on shore, okay, here's half the wavelength. So there's no energy below half the wavelength. But once you get to the point where where the depth of the water is less than one half of the wavelength, okay, the waves are going to start touching bottom and the and the wave shape is actually going to start pitching forward, okay, until until we get to the point where the wave is actually going to break at the shore. Wave erosion is caused by wave impact and pressure. It breaks down rock material and supplies sand to beaches. Abrasion is the sawing and grinding action of water armed with rock fragments. Now sand on the beaches moves, moves around quite a bit. The beaches are composed of whatever material is available. Some beaches have a lot of biological component. The material does not necessarily stay in one place. Wave energy moves large quantities of sand parallel and perpendicular to the shore. Wave refraction is the bending of a wave such that the wave arrives parallel to the shore. The results are the wave energy is concentrated against the sides and ends of a headland. Wave erosion straightens on an irregular shoreline. Okay, so here we have an irregular shoreline with a headland here. The waves, as they approach the land, they start to bend so that they'll hit the beach parallel. And that forces a lot of energy aimed directly at both sides of this headland, hopefully eroded away. So eventually, this material will be eroded and deposited on either side of the headland, so eventually you have a straight shore. Longshore transport. Okay. Beach drift is sediment moving in a zigzag pattern along the beach face. Longshore current. This is a current in the surf zone. It flows parallel to the shore. This moves a lot of sand, a sediment, um, a lot more sediment than beach drift. Okay, so, so as the waves are approaching, it's going to be producing a current that flows along the shore. Now, you ever you know, play, play at the beach and you find that you're kind of drifting? away from where you entered, well that's a longshore current kind of pulling you down the beach. Well this moves sand parallel to the beach, a large amount of sand. And as the as waves come on shore and pull off shore, they'll actually push sand up the beach and pull sand off the beach. Push sand up diagonally up the beach and pull sand off the beach. And this is beach drift, the slow moving of sand up the beach. Erosional features caused by waves, we may have a wave-cut cliff, wave-cut platforms, marine terrace, terrace, terraces, also associated with headlands, we'll have sea arches and sea stacks. Okay. So here's a sea arch, so as this headland has been beaten by the waves, or maybe a weaker part in the middle here, it got beaten out till, till it turns into an arch. Okay. Here's an island, it's probably been used to be a you probably used to have been connected to the, the shoreline, but, but the wave action probably eroded the land in between. Now here's a bay. Okay, here's a sea stack. Here's a sea arch. So this used to be one large headland. It's slowly been beaten apart. This may have been an arch before until it got broke through, leaving a sea stack. And here it broke through here, leaving a sea stack. When this finishes being eroded, it'll leave behind a sea stack. But right now it's a sea arch. Depositional features. A spit is a ridge of sand extending from the land into the mouth of an adjacent bay with an end that often hooks landward. A bay mouth bar is a sandbar that completely crosses a bay. 
and Tombolo is a ridge of sand that connects an island to the mainland. Okay, so in this diagram, this picture here, we see a spit land that extends out to the near bay and points back in landward. Here we have a bay mouth bar that crosses a, a bay. Of course, here we probably cut a navigational channel here. Okay. And let's see, here's, here's Provincetown, the end of uh, Cape Cod, and here's a Provincetown spit. Okay. Here's another picture of a spit. Here's a tone below. So here, here we have an island, there's a shore, and this beach that's been deposited here, this is the tone below. It connects the island to the shore. Other features we're a little more familiar with are barrier islands. These are mainly along the Atlantic and Gulf coastal plains, parallel to the coast, and originate in several ways. Shoreline, now the stabilizing of shore, shoreline erosion is influenced by local factors. Proximity to sediment-laden sediment -laden rivers, degree of tectonic activity, topography and composition of the land, prevailing wind and weather patterns, configuration of the coastline. So we, how we respond to regional pro problems, hard stabilization by building structures. The types of structures we build are groins, they're barriers built at right angles to the beach that are designed to trap sand. Breakwaters are barriers built offshore parallel to the coast to protect boats from breaking waves. Sea walls armors the coast against the force of breaking waves. Often these structures are not effective. Other responses, alternatives to hard stabilization, beach nourishment, nourishment by adding sand to the beach system, and relocating buildings away from the beach. Some erosion problems along the U.S. coast. The shoreline erosion problems are different along the opposite coast. So we have certain kinds of problems on the Atlantic Ocean side of the United States and different problems on the West Coast. Here's Miami Beach before beach nourishment. This photo is taken from like 1976. And we have these groins here. They're trying to trap the sand, but it's not being particularly effective. We're, we're losing the beach there. And then after beach nourishment, where they pump sand from offshore back onto the beach, they widen the beaches considerably. The Atlantic and Gulf Coast development occurs mainly on barrier islands. These face open ocean receive full force of the storms. This development has taken place more rapidly than our understanding of barrier island dynamics. These barrier islands protect us, and instead we've built upon them uh, instead of allowing them to protect our, our inner shorelines. On uh, the Pacific coast, it's characterized by relatively narrow beaches backed by steep cliffs and mountain ranges. Major problems in narrowing of beaches, sediment for beaches is interrupted by dams and reservoirs, and there's rapid erosion occurs along the beaches. You might have cliff falls. Shoreline classification is difficult. Uh, classification based on changes with respect to sea level. Uh, the emergent coast is caused by uplift of land or a drop in sea level. Features of an emergent coast are wave cut cliffs and marine terraces. So where there was a beach and the waves are cutting down the bedrock, and then that land is raised up. So now there's a new area for the waves to to, um, to erode and create a new beach, but up on the cliff side you see this flat area. That's your wave cut cliff or marine terrace. A submerged coast is caused by the land adjacent to sea subsiding or sea level rising. Features we may see are highly irregular shoreline and estuaries, which are drowned river mouths. Like we have a St. Lucie estuary and other estuaries in Florida, so we are submergent coast. Here's uh, a major estuary along the east coast of the United States is Chesapeake Bay, another one Delaware Bay, so major estuaries. Now tides are changes in elevation of ocean surface. This is caused by gravitational forces exerted upon the earth by the moon and to a lesser extent by the sun. Okay, the sun's a lot bigger than the moon, but the sun is much farther away from us than the moon is. The moon does have a greater influence upon our, our tides. Okay, so here is just an example of what tidal bulges look like. Okay, and the moon is somewhere over here. Okay, so here's the Earth, it's a little axial tilt here. The gravity of the moon is pulling on the surface of the ocean water. So the ocean water is bulging on this side and bulging on this side, but is narrowed out at the at the perpendicular extremes here. Okay, so here it's high tide. Here it's a lower high tide. 
the monthly tidal cycle. Well, spring tide during new and full moons, gravitational forces are added together, especially high and low tides, with a larger daily tidal range. Those gravitational forces that are being added together are the gravitational forces of the moon and the sun. So it's giving us higher tides and and low tides and largely daily tidal and a larger daily daily tidal range. So a larger um, Okay, so we have a higher high tides and lower low tides, so a daily tidal range is greater during the spring tides. Okay, so here's our, our spring tide. So we have a full moon over here, and the sun's over here. And then also when we have a new moon, and the moon's here, and the sun's over here, and so we're all in a plane, the gravitational forces are additive. So the darker blue here is the solar tide portion of the tide, and the lighter blue is the lunar tide portion of the tide. So we have a higher high tide and a lower low tide. Now the neap tides, okay, the first quarter moons and the third quarter moons, the plane that the, that the moon is in is perpendicular to where the sun is. So, so these gravitational forces do not add together, so we're going to have uh, lower high tides and higher low tides, or, or there'll be less effect on those tides, so the tides will be more normal. So the neap tide, first and third quarters of the moon, gravitational forces are offset, daily tidal range is at its least. Tidal patterns, there are many factors influencing the tides, the shape of the coastlines, configuration of the ocean basin, and water depth. So the main tidal patterns we'll find, there's a diurnal tidal pattern, Whereas a single high tide and low tide each tidal day, this occurs along the northern shore of the Gulf of Mexico. Semi-diurnal tidal pattern, there are two high tides and two low tides each tidal day. Little difference between high and low water heights, common along the Atlantic coast of the United States. A mixed tidal pattern, you have two, two high and two low waters each day. Large inequality in high water heights and low water heights, or both. This is prevalent along the Pacific coast of the United States. Now tidal currents, horizontal flow accompanying the rise and fall of tides, types of tidal currents. We have flood currents, which advances into the coastal zone, and ebb currents, sea water, seaward moving water. So the flood current is water coming into the coast, and then the ebb current is the water pushing out back into the ocean. Sometimes tidal delt deltas are created by tidal currents. Okay, so here we have a barrier island, a little navigational break here. So a lagoon, kind of like our Indian River Lagoon, and tidal flats. Okay, so as the tide comes in, we may have a flood current, the water pulling in here, and it drops sediment just inside the barrier island and may lead, create a tidal delta. As the low tide comes out, then there's a flood, there's a, the ebb tide or the ebb current pulling water out to the ocean. 